Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Savannah Sellers. I am an anchor and correspondent at NBC News. Thank you very much, Dara. You're welcome. Uh, Dara here, who is serving me, also is, of course, the CEO of Uber. You are all here to hear from Dara Khazrashahi about the work he is doing, the work he has done at this company. Um, and I was very lucky that I got to begin hearing about that by being driven by you in an Uber. Yes. Last you week. Should, hopefully you gave me five stars. Five stars. stars. That. Yes. Playlist could use some work. No, I'm just kidding. There was no music. Um, uh, you do drive Uber, though. You yes. do this to learn about your customer. Really, I think very interestingly, to learn about your driver. And you have actually made several changes based on what you've learned in that car. First, just tell us what made you decide to start doing this, and how often are you really behind the wheel of one of these cars? Yes, yeah, so honestly, uh, I originally started uh, delivering food. This is during the height of the pandemic because I was going effing crazy at home on Zooms, yeah. and I just needed to get out of the house. Uh, I had an e-bike in San Francisco, and at that time, the most important factor in coming back from the pandemic as, uh, as things started to open up especially was getting more drivers and more couriers on the platform. Mm. And if you look at the Uber employee population, myself included, the vast majority of us joined Uber because of the impact that the company can have and the fact that we all use the products and are very familiar with them and it's just part of mm. city living. But most of us have experienced their product through the eyes of the consumer, through the eyes of a rider or through the eyes of an eater. And as it turned out, not as many of us experienced our product through the eyes of earners. And for me, it was really eye-opening first delivering food uh, in that it was a lot tougher than I thought it was gonna be. Uh, getting start, uh, going on the platform was a little confusing. You know, where do you pick up the food? Where should I drop it off? What happens if something goes wrong, et cetera? Uh, and once I started delivering and having that experience, I decided, well, I've got, I've got to try driving. I didn't have a car, so got to use Tesla. Uh, and signed up to uh, start driving on the platform. I went through all of our own processes. And again, for us, if you're driving on the platform, we've got to do you know, a background check and vehicle, you've got to take your vehicle to get inspected. The process of onboarding can be quite complex. Uh, and again, once you're driving, you know, I got pretty nervous when I was driving, um, making sure that, that I provided good services, et cetera. But riding, so, so to speak, in the earner's shoes and understanding that experience, one, led me to really push our company and our employees and our product people uh, to have that experience as well. And two, I think has allowed us to improve our product, our earner facing product pretty significantly. How often are you driving over? I try to drive once every two or three weeks uh, and I'll get kind of three hours in the afternoon uh, and I'll drive around and I'll complete, usually I can do five to 10 trips. Uh, and every single time it's, I learn something new. And you genuinely get nervous before? I do, because you know you don't get rated every single time you do something as a CEO. It's like, I, I guess I, I guess the public markets are rating me every day. Um, but <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I actually the night before when I know I'm driving, I kind of get nervous about driving the next day because honestly, I don't want to screw it up. Um, but but for me, it's fun. It's super interesting. And you really do have a five star rating. Uh, so far, yes, yeah. unless you screw that up. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned the Tesla that you're driving. Yeah. You, know, you personally do drive this Tesla you bought used yourself, Yeah. Uh, which leads us into this big announcement that you've made, this push, zero emissions by 2030 in the US, Europe, and Canada, another goal by 2040. First, walk us through what your sustainability goals look like. Well, our sustainability goals um, simply are for us to be a fully green platform by 2030 in the US, uh, US, Canada, Europe, 2040 all over the world. We started uh, with our mobility platform. Uh, it's responsible for most of our emissions out there. Uh, and really it's about getting our driver base to make the switch from uh, internal combustion uh, uh, powered cars to electric vehicles. And there's a lot that goes in it, but that's essentially the crux of the matter on the mobility side. 
and more recently, we've been developing a strategy for delivery, and it's a similar strategy in that trying to go essentially all green by 2030 with delivery, the other factor that we're looking at is, is packaging, right? Which is when you order that Uber Eats package, often it comes in plastic containers, et cetera. So the additional angle that we've taken on the delivery side is to help restaurants source sustainable packaging uh, and allow that sustainable packaging to be an option for you to pick. And you know we've done little things uh, historically, for example, if you don't eat cutlery because you're eating at home, you know you don't need to order that stuff. But for us, giving eaters the option to choose into sustainable packaging, again, can create that economic feedback loop, which is giving restaurants an incentive to go green, not just because it's the right thing to do, because it can actually help business as well. How are you helping your drivers get there? Uh, a number of ways. Electric vehicles. Uh, a number of ways, and 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 honestly. We're going to do our part, uh, and then we've got to team up with private, public policy, et cetera, to, to accomplish this. But namely, the way that we're doing it is, first of all, we committed uh, $800 million um, to driving the sustainable, uh, to, to getting green vehicles onto the platform. Uh, first thing that we're doing is we're paying drivers more. Uh, to drive an electric vehicle. Drivers get a um, dollar more per trip that they take on an electric vehicle, uh, and that basically allows them to make more money. And if they've got the economic incentive to do, do so, that's one reason uh, to move over. And we've got to give them that economic incentive because right now electric vehicles, they just cost too much, right? And uh, the most popular, for example, model on our platform right now um, is is a, a used uh, Toyota Prius. Mm. Uh, and so we need to bring the cost of electric vehicles down. Um, we very much need a second kind of hand market to develop in EVs as well. It's not yet mature there. In the meanwhile, we're just paying drivers more. And then at the same time, we're working with industry. One, for example, we have a partnership with Hertz. We recently announced a partnership with uh, uh, with Ford to bring on Teslas and Ford mach onto the platform, rent them out to drivers who can't afford to buy them themselves. Uh, and we're doing a number of different um, deals with to get charging infrastructure into uh, cities and also give drivers discounts and, and uh, when they recharge as well because charging is a very, very large factor in terms of both availability of charging, range anxiety that everyone has uh, when they drive uh, an EV, and then of course the cost of, uh, re of uh, recharging as well. Yeah, I wanna dig in on charging again in just a minute, but let's talk a little bit more about your drivers getting to this point. First of all, what will happen in 2030 if a driver does not have an electric vehicle? Well, hopefully if we do our job, uh, and again, I would say that we need governments to pitch in, et cetera, by 2030, every single driver on the platform will have an electric vehicle because it would be crazy for them not to, okay? Um, and our job is to get to that spot. But, you know, in 2030, if a driver isn't driving an EV, then they're not gonna be able to be on our platform. That's essentially what our goal is. Does that mean that a driver, just to put a finer point on it, yeah. if they are already driving for Uber, they will be eliminated from the platform, or you just cannot join as a driver at that point? We haven't gone there yet. Um, honestly, I'm hoping that that won't be an issue because again, we will put together, they can make more money. You see that the price of Teslas, for example, are coming down now, which is great. Uh, and we expect to see some significant numbers of new models uh, coming in. And usually our drivers, remember our drivers are driving probably four to five times more miles than the average. Yeah. Uh, average driver out there. So they will change over their vehicles, we think, once every four to five years. So between now and 2030, there will come a time where the vast, vast majority of our drivers are going to make a decision as to buy a new car or lease a new car. And what we're completely focused on right now is make the decision now to switch over to uh, green, obvious, and easy 
and make it crazy not to go green, essentially. So when you say that crazy not to go green, do you mean that that's how you believe we all will feel about electric vehicles, not just your drivers? Well, listen, we're helping along in terms of uh, making it more economically viable for drivers to do so. They, they can make more money. Um, we are seeing that actually riders tip more uh, for drivers who are in EVs because uh, these cars are great. It's actually one really cool new statistic that, that we got is that in the US actually, 40% of our riders say that when they drive in either an Uber Green or uh, Comfort Electric, that's the first time they've ever been in an electric vehicle. Wow. So not only is our switching over to EVs important, and our drivers are making the switch about five times faster than the average driver out in kind of the general population. So they're switching over five times faster. They're usually covering four to five times more miles. So the impact of our drivers going green is really significant. Like this is, this is the first audience that should go green if all you're thinking about is miles traveled and contribution uh, to the environment as, as, as far as uh, output goes. Mm. But 40% of our riders this is the first time they've ever been in an EV. And when you experience an EV as a passenger, the experience tends to be a really good experience because the cars that are out there right now, you know, whether they're a Tesla or a Bolt or a Mach-E, et cetera, um, or Kias, they're awesome vehicles. So that experience then provides kind of hopefully next time you go out and get a car, you'll get an EV as well. So you, I, it's fascinating hearing that for many people, it's their first time in an EV. 40%. Yeah, it's amazing. So if you just think about, you know, maybe not for you personally, but for me, colleagues, maybe people in this room, you have a car, it works well. Mm -hmm. You've just paid it off. Mm -hmm. You don't care if it's new. You don't want to have the car payment anymore. That's all the reason that a lot of people, as you well know, are not switching to electric vehicles at this point. And seven years is not all that far away. Maybe that's still how people feel. Is your group of independent contractors, drivers, the right one to make us take that next step? Are they prepared? Are they going to be able to do that? Well, it, you know, I think um, I don't view it as making anyone take the next step. Okay. Right, which is what we want to do is create the economic incentives to do so. So for drivers, one, the pay has got to work, and we are out of our own pocket, and we should make the pay work for them. But then mm. we're, we want to create essentially more demand for those drivers who are making the switch over. So on the rider side now, uh, we're introducing green, uh, Comfort Electric. Uh, and Comfort Electric, for example, has turned out to be super popular for companies out there. We mm. have a part of our business line called Uber for Business, which is if you're a company, if you're a Facebook or any other company out there, um, you can allow essentially your employees to use Ubers to travel on business. Mm. Uh, and then and we provide those uh, businesses with a dashboard to understand what the emissions are as a result of their employees traveling. Uh, and they can elect to say, if you're an employee of NBC Universal, um, you know, we want you to take electric as well. Mm. And so companies now can push it as well. So if you have more demand coming in from uh, our riders. You've got more demand coming in from companies as well, so that not only can a driver make more per ride, but they're getting more rides mm. if they uh, go electric as well. And then for drivers, uh, more and more, we're creating more tools for them to make it easier for them to make the switch over. The number one consideration, other than what car should I buy and how much is it gonna cost me, um, and we have kind of an EV hub over there for you to be able to essentially compare the total cost of ownership of an ICE vehicle versus an electric vehicle. And if you're driving, the number of miles that our drivers are, um, and with the subsidies that we're putting in place, it makes a lot of sense to, to go electric. Mm. So first we educate drivers on that purchase decision. There's a certain percentage of our drivers, about 30%, who can't buy a car. They don't have a car available to them. So for the, that population, we say, if you can't buy a car, we're gonna make leasing options very, very easy for you. That's where our strategic partnership with Hertz and 
uh, Ford, and we have a number of other strategic partnerships out, out there uh, comes in. Then the third issue that drivers face is charging. Where am I going to charge? You know, I'm lucky enough to have a charger in my garage. Most of our drivers don't have garages, certainly can't charge in a garage. So for them, time is literally money. So for them now, we have created, uh, one, a charging map where they can see where all the charges are in the city in which they drive. Um, we then have essentially, uh, as part of that, we will advise a driver based on you can hook up your EV mm. to our app so that based on your charge, we can advise you, hey, Savannah, the best time for you to be charged is at 2.25 p.m. in this part of town. Charging rates are going to be lower. Your, the amount of earnings you're going to give up is actually going to be relatively low because it's not that busy. Mm. That's the time that you should charge, and here are some places uh, for you. And then what we have is uh, essentially destination or charge aware routing, which is um, if your charge is getting down to 10%, 15%, we're not going to send you on a long trip in a destination that doesn't have any chargers close by. So that you always know that you're safe and essentially the pings that we send you and the routes that we send you aren't going to leave you in a bad spot so that you don't have to kind of constantly recalc, should I take this trip, should I not take this trip, et cetera. We do all that work for you. So it's all about like just making it unbelievably easy for the rider to choose to uh, you know, do their little bit to save the environment, and then for the drivers to do their bit in, in terms of going green as well. We want to make it incredibly effortless, incredibly easy, um, incredibly frictionless, one of the new features that we're really excited about is that riders now can, we have an emissions hub, which is you can identify just how much emissions you're saving by choosing to go green as well. We'll badge it, et cetera. You can have a race with your friends and kind of you know, tweet it to your friends as, as far as how much you save the environment or how many emissions you've avoided as a result of going green as well. Mm. When will a lot of that be available? Uh, everything I talked about is, is available now, essentially, or will be available in the next couple of months. I mean, we're doing this now, and listen, 2030 is coming up fast, yeah. right? So if you look today uh, on a global basis, uh, actually in the U.S., about 5% of our miles are now electric. Uh, in California, in California has, you know, is really leading the pack in the United States as far as having the right incentives, having charging infrastructure, et cetera. It's 10% of miles. Uh, in London, which is, you know, they have really taken seriously the, the call to go electric. It includes like congestion pricing, et cetera. There are other economic incentives that London has put in place. About 20% of our miles are electric. We've got about 60,000 drivers now globally who are driving EVs, three times the number where we were last year. So we've got a while to go, but, but it's absolutely the case that the momentum is there for us. You said it, 2030 is coming fast. Yeah. How are you communicating with your drivers that they have to have an electric vehicle in seven years? Um, we're not communicating. Well, they all know that we made the pledge by 2030. You know, we want to be essentially all electric uh, on our platform. So they understand it. But right now, it's more of a pull. Like, we've got to create that economic flywheel for our drivers. Um, I think drivers, when they experience one of, one of the most positive factors in terms of having them make the switch is, you know, try, try before you buy. So the program that we have with Hertz and uh, Ford are incredibly important in that, for example, <laughs> For 300 bucks a week, bless you, um, you can essentially uh, rent a Tesla, and a Tesla is a great car, right? Uh, and you can understand what the experience is. You can understand what all the tooling that we offer, uh, offer you is. You can understand how much more you can make. And the economics really do work for those drivers. That then allows the drivers to feel safe in making the decision, the big purchase decision, in terms of going green. So it's not make, it's, it's let's incentivize. Let's, it's gotta be a pull. And again, the incentives have to come from us. 
Um, the incentives hopefully will come from riders. Uh, and, and one interesting factor that we've seen with riders is that riders, if you try to charge a premium for, uh, for green, it's not going to work. So even though riders want to do the right thing, if they have to pay more, um, a, much, a much smaller segment of riders then start taking green options. It's just mm -hmm. how life works. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, we're very data-driven, and you've got to work within the bounds that you see. But while, riders, while the majority of riders aren't willing to pay with dollars, they are willing to pay with their time. So if the average ETA for an UberX in a particular city is, let's say, five, six minutes, and the average ETA for an Uber Green is seven, eight minutes, riders will pay with their time. They'll pay that, essentially, time premium. And getting the economic incentives of more demand, higher revenue per trip, a cheap way to make the switch to electric, and then a safe way to make the switch to electric, which is try before you buy, all of that has to kind of come together and I think for us, the elements are there, um, but we need more government incentives, and we definitely, definitely, definitely need more charging infrastructure. And so while we're in this period where we don't know when we will get there, in those two regards, when government incentives, get there. I mean, government incentives and the charging infrastructure. Yeah. In the meantime, how do you balance your climate mission with what is just the reality for your drivers, that those cars are still expensive and they are tough to charge? Uh, I think the fact is that, you know, short term, this is an investment. Uh, it's an investment in terms of money for us. It's an investment in terms of time. It's an investment in terms of my team's focus, a lot of our focus. So if I were a short term animal thinking about optimizing for Uber's future in the next three years, I wouldn't be making the decisions, the kinds of decisions that we're mm. making. Uh, but I think that it's everybody's responsibility to um, play their part in the climate fight. I very much believe that it's in Uber's long-term interest to make this transition. Uh, if we are increasingly a part of or another reason why uh, our globe is getting hotter, um, then we're not going to win the hearts and minds of the public or the mayors of the world um, who are running the cities in which, in which we operate. So I, I think like we just have to make this investment over the long term. Um, you know, I think I can't tell you exactly what my tactics are going to be three years from now. But um, I think if we do our job and we increasingly work with governments, both local, national governments, and, and I do think governments on average are doing more. We just honestly wish that we, they do more faster. Um, we think the elements are going to fall into place for all of us to come together. And, and I do think you know, we want to be the safest, cleanest transportation platform on Earth, like bar none. Uh, and if we are the safest, cleanest transportation platform on Earth, I think that's good business. Mm. Now, it's good business doing the right thing, but ultimately, that's good business. That's another reason why, hopefully, you'll pick Uber uh, uh, against the competing platform. And if we lead, then I think our competitors are going to have to chase. And so if our competitors are chasing along this uh, green path as well, well, that's a good thing. I'm just hoping to run a little bit faster than they are. <laughs> Yeah, and there have been some behind you who have announced the same yeah, thing. Yeah, listen, I, I, I don't think they have a choice, by the way. Mm. So just to follow up on something I asked a second ago and that we talked about in the car last week, last week you had told me they'll be off our platform if they don't have an EV by 2030. Mm -hmm. Will the way that you approach that in terms of, you know, what I asked before, new drivers signing up, can they, they won't be allowed unless they have an electric vehicle versus existing drivers. Will that decision come as you see how you're reaching that goal? What will that look like? I, I think ultimately those are the kinds of decisions that, that we're going to have to make. And, and listen, it's no different for us, which is um, vehicles that are uh, of a certain age, we don't allow on our platform today. So we already have kind of classification in terms of what kind of vehicles qualify for to, for Uber, mm -hmm. what kind of vehicles qualify for Uber Comfort, Black, et cetera. It's no different from that. And the classification as we approach 2030 
We're going to give our drivers plenty of time, you know, which is, hey, in three years, you're going to have to have an electric vehicle in order to be on the platform. Here are all the ways in which we can help you make that transformation. And again, if the trends that I'm seeing now hold true, it's going to get cheaper. It's going to get easier. There's going to be more charging infrastructure. And I think the, you know, I think the economics three to four years from now will be overwhelmingly will, will play in the favor of making that switch over. How do you feel about the product? Just the other day, actually, right here on this yeah. stage, the CEO of GM, Mary Barra, said in a fantastic interview with my brilliant new boss, Rebecca Blumenstein of NBC News, that by 2030, GM is hoping to be at 50% electric vehicles. By 2035, 100%. Yeah. Obviously, there are several other companies producing many more electric vehicles. Tesla, well, we'll, of course, being we'll one of them. We'll pick her 50%. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about the product and the options that there really will be in terms of a range of prices? I, I think that today we don't have enough and they're not cheap enough. But based on we are very closely in touch with all the OEMs in the world from GM to Ford to Toyota, et cetera. Uh, and at least the plans that we see in place now in terms of the supply base coming out, like. What, you know, maybe 50% of GMs will be electric by 2030, but f it looks like 90, 95% of the new plants going in yeah. for OEMs and manufacturers, it's just dedicated to going green. The vehicles are excellent, the quality is excellent, and I do think the prices are coming down. And I will say, Tesla is pushing prices down, I think, faster than a lot of people expected. Uh, and that's a very, very good trend that I hope uh, mm. extends going forward. Let's talk through also the specifics on delivery. Yes. If McDonald's is using plastic forks, any other company, just picking one that I know I is on your platform. McDonald's uses forks. Too. <laughs> I, I guess it depends what you order. If you yes. get a salad, which maybe isn't common. Um, <laughs> if any type of restaurant is using plastic forks still, or their containers are plastic, they haven't found the supplier yeah. that can bring the price down for them. Will they not be on your platform? How will that work? So I, I think for now, uh, honestly, we haven't thought about exactly what, our, what we're going to be doing in 2030. We always want to try to start with incentives. So the incentives right now mm -hmm. for us are, and, and by the way, the McDonald's of the world, a lot of the larger chains, they have the capital and the wherewithal and the vision to make these changes. And I don't think McDonald's is going to be a problem at all. McDonald's is going to be part of the solution. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying that because they're a big client. I, <laughs> I, I really do think it's true. Uh, so I think for us, the challenge is going to be more SMB, smaller, mm -hmm. medium businesses. And what we want to do first is create the incentives for them to switch over. What are the incentives? Is revenue and cost. So on the revenue side, uh, you know, SMBs come onto their platform, and we have about a million businesses who are on our platform uh, right now. Uh, and we work with them, and we work with them to increase sales. Uh, and if we give eaters the choice to essentially filter out non-environmentally sustainable packaging, we think that those SMBs that make the switch over, they're just going to make more money. They're going to move higher in the sort order, so to speak. They're going to get more promotion. They're going to get more audience, and they're going to get more business. We will get that flywheel into place. Um, we then have communication mechanisms to uh, these stores, which is, Savannah, if you make the switch over to sustainable packaging, your business on Uber Eats will increase by 23%. You know, that's another 103 orders per week. Doesn't that make sense to you? Th that's the kind of moves that we're going to make uh, for these restaurants. And then we will, we have a plan in place to essentially go out and help these SMBs essentially find local vendors in every single one of these cities and help these SMBs source sustainable packaging if they want help. A lot of them are already moving in the right direction. I think people want to do the right thing generally. Mm. Um, and so I do think it'll start with incentives and hopefully if we do our jobs right, again, by 2030, we'll be there. We won't be able to, we won't need to use a stick, so to speak. Mm. Um, we'll, we'll pull our way there. So it's no secret, Uber doesn't own the cars, the drivers do. Same with these businesses, you're not involved in the restaurant industry directly. Yeah. These changes and your goals rely on other people making big changes. Are you worried about 
the fact that it's not your company that you could say this is the decision I'm making for us, that you're relying on them to reach a goal within seven years? Yeah, I think that um, you know, it's one of the trade-offs that Uber has made in terms of being a platform. Uh, we can have much greater impact as a platform by being a platform that essentially doesn't control the vertical stack, so to speak. You know, so we can, mm -hmm. we can extend our reach. We can have a much larger audience. We can, you know, we can reach 130 million active platform cons consumers on a monthly basis. If we controlled everything on a vertical stack, we couldn't be in 60 different countries. We couldn't be in all the cities because it would just cost too much to build, to build up the infrastructure. So I think there's always a trade-off in life, right? If you want full control, then you gotta go narrow. If you want to go as broad and be as ubiquitous as Uber is, you've got to give up some control. Uh, and ultimately, when I think about, you know, if I had a full stack platform, I could get 10% of Uber's eventual reach perfectly green, or I could get 100% mm. of Uber's reach, you know, 97% or 95% green without as much control, having to negotiate with a lot of folks, having to bring in a bunch of industry in, having to bring a bunch of government in because I can't do it all myself, I'll take the trade off of being broader because ultimately I'll have greater impact on the world. Um, but yeah, you're right, it's a, it's a trade off that we've made, but I think it's the right trade off for us. Yeah. And also that sounds like maybe you are leaving some room for working with drivers, working with the restaurant industry to try to get them there if they're not by a deadline? Oh yeah, listen, we're, we're gonna, like, we are partnering with them very, very closely. And remember too that we, for example, we partner with fleets uh, in many markets, especially international markets, who buy their cars, et cetera. So there are entities that look like what you're describing, which is hey, it's a vertical stack, you employ your drivers, you buy your cars, et cetera. There are many, many local entities like that in the various cities and the various countries in which we operate, and we will work through them essentially. And again, we will create the economic incentives where we as a platform can deliver more to you in terms of economics per ride. We can bring more demand to you mm. if you're a restaurant or again, if you're a fleet, and we will help you make it uh, cheaper. And then we will take kind of the leadership uh, position in terms of talking with governments, et cetera, to help them make those right decisions. Frankly, all governments, et cetera, cities, they're moving in the right direction. We just wanna make them move faster. What type of conversations are you having, partnerships are you exploring when it comes to the charging infrastructure? Um, the, the first, the, the biggest is uh, for us to try to make it move faster and it's a combination of discussion. It's, it's public and private partnerships out there, for example, one private partnership that we have that we're very excited about it with, is with BP, right? BP gas stations out there, but um, they are making a very, very significant investment um, in recharging infrastructure. And we have a deal with them essentially to provide discounts to our drivers. And again, it's another reason to be on the Uber platform because you can get a discount on driving. So all of this, it helps overall but it also helps specifically our platform be more environmentally friendly. So those are the kinds of discussions. Frankly, we have those biz dev discussions in every single country in which we operate with. The biggest worry that I, that I have right now is that while charging infrastructure is moving in the right direction um, in many of the cities in which we operate, the um, most governments prioritize the center of cities where the more many more fortunate people live and that's where business districts are, et cetera. Uh, and that makes sense to a certain uh, aspect, but it doesn't make as much sense for our drivers in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, when they go home at night and making sure that we have driving, uh, we have charging infrastructure closer to their homes and closer to their neighborhoods. So we have a team now working with governments, providing them the data as to where are the rides happening in, uh, on our platform. Generally on our platform, the fastest growing parts of our platform are actually not in city centers, but are in kind of the secondary parts of the city and outskirts uh, of the city. That's by far the fastest growing part of our platform. 
and then it's providing that data to city governments, uh, to local governments as to where they should put their charging infrastructure so that you're not just serving, let's say, the middle of the city, but you're serving um, a fair reflection of the population at hand. Mm -hmm. I want to get to autonomous vehicles in just a moment Absolutely. before we wrap up. But before I do, I just want to ask you about some news that came out yesterday. DoorDash announcing some changes in how they will allow their workers to be paid. Uh, essentially, they could choose to be paid hourly. There's a lot of fine print there in terms of still the waiting time is not paid, things like that. What do you think about that, though? Change coming to gig economy payment? I, I think generally uh, giving um, gig economy, like platform workers, more choice is a positive factor. So to the extent that that's another way of earning, and, and I do think that uh, whether or not this went into DoorDash's thinking, the, the really, really cool thing about Uber as a platform is that you essentially, as, as an earner on the platform, the more utility you add to the platform, the more you drive, or the better times you drive, or the better areas that, that you drive in, the more money you make. Mm. Uh, and we have a take rate, but essentially our interests are aligned. Kind of the more the earner makes, the more we make. Um, uh, earners, last quarter, you know, they, they earned well over $10 billion on our platform, including tips. It was up 30% on a year on year basis. Our business was up 22% year on year. So we're sharing more and more of the monies that are created on the platform with our earners. The issue is that while the more utility you add to the platform, the more you make, the earnings can be quite volatile in terms of, you know, I work three hours, like I've, I drove in, the last time I drove in SF, I made 45 bucks for kind of my own utilized hours in, in SF. Mm -hmm. That was a good day. I've had days where I've made 25 bucks an hour, right? And for me, that's interesting. For a driver, when they have that day, if they, if they make 20 bucks an hour, $25 an hour, our drivers make an average of $33 per utilized hour, those aren't such good days. So there may be certain circumstances where a driver says, you know, I want to know how much I make per hour. I don't want this variability, et cetera. I want to put my mind at ease. If the DoorDash policy is giving uh, their couriers more ways or more choice, that's a nice thing. What are your plans for Uber when it comes to autonomous vehicles? Uh, we are going out and we're partnering with autonomous providers. I mean, ultimately, uh, we want our platform to be the safest platform. Uh, we want it to be uh, the cleanest platform, so to speak. Uh, and ultimately, we think autonomous can be a part of that solution. Uh, and, you know, we want every single driver on Earth to be on a platform. If that driver happens to be a robot, that's okay, as long as that driver's safe and kind of passes a safety test, so to speak. Um, you know, the latest announcement that we made was with Waymo, uh, who is a leader in the field. But we're working with autonomous, not just in passenger uh, mobility, but also delivery. So, and we work, for example, with Serve in Los Angeles. There are these really cute sidewalk robots that walk around on, on the sidewalk. And then with an Aurora in trucking really as cute. well. They're very cute. They have these big, cute eyes and all that stuff. I, I want to hug them. They won't <laughs> hug me. Um, but so autonomous is going to be part of our business, whether it's trucking or it's delivery or it's mobility. I think it's still a, a ways to come. It's going to take a very long time for this technology to be commercialized in at significant scale. Uh, but when it gets there, we've got the largest platform. We bring more demand than any other platform on earth across every single kind of call it autonomous category. So we think we'll have lots of autonomous partners uh, in, in all categories. So down the road, any idea what that means for the human drivers? Yeah. Uh, well, I think we're going to, you know, my bet is 10 years from now, we're going to have significantly more human drivers on the platform than we do today. Mm. Uh, but, you know, would I be surprised if 10 or 20% of the drivers on our platform are robots? No. Uh, I think it can get there. There's always this drama of, you know, are the robots going to replace humans? Right. I think the reality is robots augment humans. And there are going to be certain routes that are simpler routes. The pickup drop off is right next to you, et cetera. The regulatory regime is there where autonomous driving makes a lot of sense. And there are going to be many, many instances where a human driver will make more, more sense. We will have essentially a layer 
kind of uh, a pricing layer and a routing layer that will make the decision that based on one particular pickup, should I send a human, should I send a robot, which one should I send, how should I price it, et cetera. So that traffic control cop, so to speak, is where we're quite focused on right now. And you don't explicitly see it as a threat to the driver's jobs? Uh, I think that if autonomous helps get more cars on the road and increase the availability of transportation, uh, bring prices down over a period of time, ultimately that's gonna spur more demand uh, and ultimately that's gonna increase cost, uh, it's gonna increase jobs for everybody. 40 minutes went very fast. We only have about a minute <laughs> left. Um, I'll end with this. Uber was a huge idea, totally yeah. changed the world, changed how we all move. Going zero emissions, at least in the US, Canada, and Europe by 2030 is a huge idea. What's next? Uh, well, I think I've got enough on my plate uh, for now. But I, I, I think, listen, what, what excites us is, is that you know, we're reimagining the way the world uh, moves. And so every single vehicle out there that's available to move people or food or anything, right? Trucks, groceries, uh, pharma uh, pharmacy, alcohol, et cetera. Basically any vehicle that's available to move anyone, either on demand or now increasingly scheduled, we wanna wire up and we wanna make it available to you uh, in an incredibly easy, delightful way. And if we do our job, that vehicle will be a green vehicle. Well, as you do figure out what's next and as you make decisions along the road to 2030, come tell your friends at NBC News. 100%. <laughs> Dara Khazra Shahi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.